Well, if a new Christian were to come up to you and say, Tim, how do I grow in grace? How do I grow in my love for God? What do I do to grow nearer to God? How do I um, put off the remaining corruption in my body? How do I fight sin and temptation and look more and more like Christ every single day? If that were you, if the question were posed to you, what would you say? Would you uh, point them to mountaintop experiences and revivals and listening to Hillsong worship music to feel something day by day? Or would you point them to God's established means of graces, God's established means of grace? You know what I mean? Um, namely, attending worship, going to church, reading the Word of God, um, meditating on the Word of God, uh, private and corporate prayer, and uh, the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism. So that's what we're talking about today, the means of grace. How do we grow in grace? How do we receive God's grace now that we have been saved? And uh, what are the means of grace? Um, my name is Tim. We are today on chapter 9 of With Reverence and Awe, Returning to the Basics of Reformed Worship. We're almost at the end of our series, and uh, today we are talking about the means of grace. The chapter begins with a question from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 88. Question, what are the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption? Answer, the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption are his ordinances, especially the word, sacraments, and prayer all of which are made effectual to the elect for their salvation. So earlier in the book, we have discussed the vertical dimension or the dialogical principle of worship. This is where worship is for God and not for us. God is our audience. God, um, worship is intended for God and uh, not the unchurched seeker as so many seeker sensitive and more progressive churches are adjusting their worship to um, accommodate to the seeker-sensitive person to make it an evangelistic event rather than worshiping God and feeding the flock. Worship, then, is not chiefly about evangelism, nor is it a concert, a lecture, or a counseling session, even though all of those things are good in and of themselves for Christians, but none of them constitute what is public worship. Our focus turns to what worship does for the church and how it nurtures and edifies believers through the means of grace. The Bible makes it clear that when we praise and glorify God, we are blessed. The way God causes Christians to grow in grace is principally through worship that pleases and honors Him. And I remember because I was one time that Christian who came up to my, um, at the time, new pastor, and I said, Pastor, how do I grow my love for God? And I was expecting... Um, I don't know, a long presentation or, okay, listen, this is what you do day by day by day by day. And uh, he gave me something that at the time I was a little bit disappointed with. He said, read the word of God, pray, and uh, by implication, he meant come to church and worship God. Um, in retrospect, that was like maybe three something years ago. Um, that makes sense. That's what we're talking about today. God has established means by which we receive his grace and uh, the application of his redemption. Um, when we look at Psalm 1, where it says, Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Growth in grace for the believer will come when he obeys God, and when he looks to Christ as God has said. He is like a tree by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The vertical character of worship then contains a blessing for us. We don't need to add anything to worship in any horizontal elements for our benefit. The Westminster Shorter Catechism spells this out, affirming that God makes preaching, the sacraments, and prayer effectual means of saving his people. The reason why these elements of worship are called ordinary is because they work slowly and quietly in reorienting our hearts heavenward. It's not extravagant, instant gratification 
we're boom and we feel more spiritual or we're, we're more Christ-like. But day by day by day, we eat the manna that God provides. We faithfully partake of what he has given us, not adding or grumbling or um, innovating something that he has not prescribed. But we obediently and humbly come to him and re receive what he freely gives to us, the word, prayer, and worship. They're not a quick fix, nor do they necessarily produce a spiritual high. After many, many, many days in the wilderness, I don't think the Israelites were ravished and excited to eat that manna necessarily. But to miss the blessings of the ordinances that God has ordained is to forget that God is wise and knows what is best. God says, these are the means that I have given to you to grow. And if we are to reject these things and say they're boring, we want to make our own stuff, what is that saying about us? Is that not saying that, no God, we know better than you? Is that not saying, no God, we don't want what you're giving to us? Consider the experiences of the early church on the day of Pentecost. This is significant. What happened if you look back to Acts chapter 2, um, to the 3,000 new Christians did they pursue extraordinary experiences of spiritual ec ecstasy? No, on the contrary. They attended to the outward and ordinary means of grace. Quote, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Acts 2.42 So if that was true for the early church, how can it be otherwise for the church in her current pilgrimage? More so, should it be for us to devote ourselves to these things? To speak of means, what does that actually mean? Is simply a way of referring is simply a way of referring to God's providences. God works extraordinarily and supernaturally when He causes lightning and fire to come out of heaven. That is, that is God directly working in uh, time and space in our world. But God also works through secondary, ordinary means. God works through magistrates, through um, all sorts of material things, how God uh, rules and governs the world. So the word of God and, and worship are secondary means that God has brought about. And when we speak about providence, the Confession, Westminster Catechism says, it is God's providence um, to preserve and govern all of his creatures and all of their actions, Q&A 11. God does not carry out his purposes in history only through miracles or the regeneration of the human soul, but as you may see, as you may know, God works every single day through secondary means, through people, through all sorts of things that he has created. He controls all of history through the use of secondary means to be sure to affirm that God uses all aspects of creation to perform his bidding is not only to deny supernaturalism, um, sorry, so to say that God works through secondary means is not to deny supernaturalism. God still works through um, primary means, we can say, and so when we say that God works through secondary means, we're not denying supernaturalism or the truth and reality of miracles. The Westminster Confession refers to means in its chapter on providence. Quote, God in his ordinary providence makes use of means, yet is free to work without, above, and against them at his pleasure. So this we find in paragraph uh, 3 of chapter 5. But sometimes the 20th century Protestant church has forgotten that God uses all things to carry out a saving purpose, namely the ordinary means of grace. The church is like the Israelites in the wilderness, where we read in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. She is like an alien and a strange person in this present life, 1 Peter 2 verse 11, who seeks a heavenly country, Hebrews 11 verse 16, because this world is not her home. The means of grace that God provides in worship are sustenance for believers. If we avoid them or take them for granted, it is likely we do not understand how difficult this pilgrimage of the Christian life is and how generous is God's provision. Just because the means of grace are ordinary don't mean we should equate the common with boring. They are not boring. 
This shouldn't be a surprise to God's people because just as God fed the Israelites with manna, with ordinary and and unflattering manna every single day, and they grumbled despite his provision for them, likewise we too grumble when God provides ordinary means to feed us and provide grace to us in our um, journey. To be sure, God can work extraordinarily, but to acknowledge this is to not expand our options, thereby allowing us to find means of grace of our own devising. The Christian pilgrimage is a corporate journey. Therefore, public worship is not optional for believers because it is the time when the church chiefly conducts its ministry work. When we come to worship, we are not consumers seeking an individual experience. Public worship is always in the company of the saints and its activities are for the participation of the whole congregation. So, how do the means of grace communicate grace to us? That's the big question. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says that the word read, and especially preached, the sacraments and prayer, are the means by which Christ communicates the benefits of his redemption, namely justification, adoption, and sanctification. Additional benefits include the assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Ghost, and perseverance therein to the end. In our day and age, the world tells church leaders that the sermon is an ineffective and outdated means of communication. Yet here, the church must be countercultural and trust in the promises of God, even if it appears foolish according to the wisdom of our age. Ultimately, the work of salvation belongs to the Holy Spirit who applies Christ's work of redemption. So the Word works in unison with the Holy Spirit to change us, to convict us, to conform us into the image of Christ. As for prayer, when we offer up our requests to God for the things agreeable to His will, then our prayers will be a blessing to us and cause us to grow in grace. This can happen privately, but corporate prayer knits the hearts of church members together. Dieticianers, or people who are often on diets, I guess you can call them dieters, know how dubious the promises of many heavily advertised weight loss programs are, how doubtful and, and, and uncertain and too good to be true they are. God's diet, however, is a sure thing. He promises you today that if you will, by faith, come to church and worship, come to his word with faith, come to prayer and pray his promises and pray his will back to him, God is not a liar and he promises that he will certainly um, cause us to grow in grace. So the choice comes down to eating the manna of God's gracious provision or supping on the food of our own creation. In worship, through the means of grace, God is also at work, extending his blessings to his people and transforming us into the image of his Son. Amen. So that ends chapter 9 of the means of grace, and I hope you learned something new, and uh, we hope to see you again next time. God bless you.